Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Mary Jo Kane, and I'm the department chair of the School of Kinesiology, and I'm also the director of the Tucker Center. Before I begin the introductions uh, of our distinguished panelists, I want to thank you all for coming to tonight's presentation. And I also want to let you know that there's a reception right after the presenter's remarks and what I'm sure will be a very thought-provoking question and answer session. And you should also know that during the reception, the authors will be signing free copies of the report. So we have a bunch out there. Um, I also want to acknowledge uh, a, a few people in the audience tonight because the Tucker Center could not be successful and thrive without it, especially at key locations across the university. So first, from the office of the, and so I'm gonna ask the individual to stand. Please hold your applause until, until the end. So first, from the office of the president, Lynn Holleran. Shirley Garner, who's the associate dean of the graduate school. You can stay standing, it's okay. <laughs> they're, they're Minnesotans, so they feel a need to sit down right away. Uh, Jean Kwam, who is the senior associate dean of the College of Education and Human Development. Uh, Dale Blythe, I haven't seen you, but are you out there anywhere? Um, and professor and co-director of the Tucker Center, Maureen Weiss. So how about a round of applause? Um, the other thing I could, now there's a lot of people back there and there are some empty seats down here if you all want to come down. Just take a couple of minutes, you can come down, it's okay. No, you're too, you're too, you're too shy, but there's some, there's some seats in here if you want to sit down. And I know that a lot of you are going to want to leave right after the, before the Q&A and we'll, we'll let you do that. So just come on in and sit down. Um, the other thing I want to do, is, as uh, many of you in the audience know, tonight, in addition to obviously uh, ha introducing the panel, we're also launching the 2007 Tucker Center Research Report. And this report could never have happened without very generous financial contributions from a number of individuals, uh, at least two of whom are in the audience tonight. So Mary Beth Berry is, I saw you earlier, where are you, Mary Beth? She, Deborah Knoll. <laughs> Sandy Peterson, are you here? There you are, Sandy Peterson. <laughs> and Lauren Weck, are you in the audience? Lauren. Okay. Um, I, finally, I want to acknowledge the members of the Tucker team for all of the hard work that they have done behind the scenes to make this event happen. Aaron Becker, Chelsea Rod, and last but never least, Jonathan Sweet. How about a round of applause? <clears throat> um, many of you come to our spring lecture every year, and for those of you who do, you'll know that, remember that um, this event in large measure is underwritten um, because of the generosity of two individuals, Mike and Van Mueller. And it is also at the spring lecture that we announce the Edie Mueller Scholarship winners. Edie Mueller was a park and recreation major at the University of Minnesota until her untimely death in 1982. Her parents, Mike and Van Mueller, have established a fitting tribute to honor the vitality of their daughter's life. The Edie Mueller Scholarship encourages undergraduates pursuing majors in recreation, park, and leisure studies to deepen their commitment to this area of academic study and professional practice. And we have two winners tonight that I want to acknowledge. The first is Anthony Bates. Anthony, can you come up on the stage, please? Anthony is a senior with a grade point average of 3.1. He's using the scholarship for an internship with the City of Minneapolis Parks and Rec Department. Anthony's interest involved, er, involves urban community settings where he hopes to impact as many youth as possible and to eventually become a supervisor of his own parks and rec facility. Congratulations to Anthony Bates. Our second scholarship winner is Crystal Hill. So Crystal, if you'd like to come up on stage, please. <laughs> Crystal.
Crystal is a senior majoring in therapeutic recreation with a 3.7 GPA. She's finishing her coursework with an internship at Shriners Hospital for Children, and Crystal wants to work as a certified TR specialist in a children's hospital where she can improve the quality of life not only for children, but for their families and their communities. Congratulations, Crystal Hill. And as I said, none of this would be possible without the generosity and wonderful support of Mike and Van Mueller. So would you please stand up and let's hear it for the Mueller's. <laughs> to begin tonight's festivities, we're gonna see a short video clip from President Robert Brunix, who couldn't be with us in person but who has played a major role in supporting the Tucker Center from the very beginning. Good evening. I'm Bob Runix, president of the University of Minnesota. It's my great and distinct pleasure this evening to welcome you to the Tucker Center Spring Distinguished Lecture. The Tucker Center for Research on Girls and Women in Sport was established in 1993 it was established through a very generous gift from Dr. Dorothy McNeil Tucker, a 1945 graduate of the College of Education and Human Development. At that time, I served as dean of the college, and it was my great distinct honor and privilege, along with Dr. Mary Jo Kane and Dr. Michael Wade, to negotiate this gift that established the center. Every year, the Tucker Center uh, provides distinguished lectures and very important publications uh, related to its mission of improving the health and well-being of young women in our society. In 2007, the Tucker Center once again produced a very important seminal report, a report entitled Developing Physically Active Girls. This report will be profoundly important. It provides a roadmap for ensuring the health and well-being of all girls and young women in our society. As one of the leading research and educational institutions, the University of Minnesota is deeply proud of the work of the Tucker Center and this very important contribution on the advantages of physical activity. I want to applaud the Tucker Center once again for its national and international leadership in focusing on issues that are profoundly important to the health and well-being of people in our state, our nation, and around the world. In 1997, the Tucker Center, in collaboration with the President's Council on Physical Fitness and Sports, produced the groundbreaking report, Physical Activity and Sport in the Lives of Girls. The purpose of the original report was to highlight the numerous ways physical activity and sports have become essential elements of girls' lives. Using an interdisciplinary perspective, this report examined the physical, psychological, social, and cultural benefits girls derive from participation in sport and physical activity, the barriers that prevent them from reaching their full potential, and the kinds of environments which develop the best parts of girls both on and off the playing fields. A key question we asked in the original report, and one that is central to our current endeavor, is how can we create environments that able, enable girls to reach their potential, their full potential, through sport and physical activity? One answer can be found in the comments of former Secretary of Health and Human Services, Donna Shalala, and I quote, we need to develop a national commitment to ensure that every girl receives the encouragement, training, and support she needs to develop and maintain an active lifestyle. Increasing physical activity among girls is a formidable public health challenge, but the potential rewards are great. At the Tucker Center, we believe that one way to instill such a commitment is to use research as a pathway to knowledge. Since the original report was published a decade ago, we have distributed over 10,000 full reports and close to 20,000 executive summaries worldwide. At colleges and universities, students and faculty have not only used the original report for their personal libraries, but numerous educators have required it as a classroom text. Given the scope and impact of our initial report, interest in an updated ver version began to increase. So as the 10th anniversary approached, we saw the need to produce a follow-up study. 
Our 10-year update focuses on the psychological, sociological, and physiological dimensions, as well as impact, of physical activity in the lives of girls. An important addition to the current report is the inclusion of an innovative best practices chapter that provides in-depth research-based information on how practitioners can create and implement a best practices sport or physical activity program for girls. Research is far too often viewed by practitioners as having little or no practical application to their everyday lives. To bridge this gap, we ask the authors to produce a roadmap for these professionals, from the coach of an AAU girls basketball team to a community parks and recreation director that would translate research findings into concrete, practical suggestions. We believe that our new report will serve as an inspiration and catalyst for change. By working together, parents, coaches, educators, and policymakers can create opportunities for diverse populations of girls to initiate and sustain physical activity throughout their lives. When we do so, we make an enormous difference in one of this country's most important assets, girls. It is now my great pleasure to introduce to you the authors of this report. Nicole Lavoie received her PhD in sports psychology from the University of Minnesota. In addition to being the associate director of the Tucker Center, Dr. Lavoie is a founding member of the Minnesota Youth Sports Research Consortium. Her research explores ways in which parents and coaches affect the sport experience and psychosocial outcomes for youth athletes. Previously, Dr. Lavoie served as a research associate at the Mendelssohn Center for Sport, Character, and Culture at the University of Notre Dame and was the head women's tennis coach at Wellesley. Please welcome Nicole Lavoie. Barbara Ainsworth is a professor in the Department of Exercise and Wellness at Arizona State University. As one of this country's most prolific and distinguished exercise physiologists, she examines physical activity and public health with a particular focus on neighborhood environmental supports for physical activity. Professor Ainsworth is best known as lead author of the Compendium of Physical Activities, an exhaustive list of energy costs related to human physical activity. She is a member of the President's Council on Physical Fitness and Sports Scientific Advisory Committee and is a fellow in several prestigious academic societies ranging from the American Academy of Kinesiology and Physical Education to the American College of Sports Medicine. Last but not least, she is a recent ACSM National Citation Award recipient and a 2008 Presidential Lecturer. Please welcome University of Minnesota alum, Barbara Ainsworth. Our third panelist is Margaret Carlisle Duncan, professor in the Department of Human Movement Sciences at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. Professor Duncan's research explores portrayals of female athletes and women's sports in mainstream media. Some of you may know that I've done a little bit of research in this area myself, and I wanna say publicly for the first time that no one has influenced my work more on media representations of female athletes, both theoretically and methodologically, than Margaret Duncan. Some of her most recent research focuses on intersections of race, class, and gender, and how they shape one's experience of one's body. She is also co-author of four groundbreaking sport media studies commissioned by the Amateur Athletic Foundation of Los Angeles. Professor Duncan is the past president of the North American Society for the Sociology of Sport and a former editor of the journal Play and Culture. She too has been elected as a fellow in the American Academy of Kinesiology and Physical Education and was recently named a University of Wisconsin Teaching Fellow. Please welcome Margaret Duncan. Our last panelist is Diane Weiss Bjornstahl, who is a professor in the School of Kinesiology and, a, and an affiliated scholar with the Tucker Center. She received her PhD from the University of Oregon with an emphasis in sports psychology and biomechanics. She is one of our nation's leading experts on the psychology of sport injury, and in that capacity has co-edited the book, Counseling in Sports Medicine. 
Professor Wiesbjornstahl also examines critical issues surrounding competitive sport for children and youth, and she has served on a number of editorial review boards and is a fellow of the Association of Applied Sport Psychology. Please welcome Diane Wiesbjornstahl. So uh, here's how the format is going to go. Um, in terms of uh, uh, the speakers, Dr. Lavoy will set the stage by first focusing on current physical activity patterns among young girls, and then her presentation will be followed by key findings from the other authors' respective academic disciplines. And then at the end, to wrap it up, they will focus how they have all come together to create a best practices model for engaging girls in lifetime sport and physical activity. You're in for a treat, and take it away, Dr. Lavoy. Good evening. Thank you, Dr. Kane. Um, I'm really honored to be part of this p distinguished panel, and as an author of the report, uh, when I returned to the U of M and took the position at the Tucker Center, this report was exactly the kind of multidisciplinary and collaborative work that I hope to be a part of. So, as Dr. Kane mentioned, um, interest in the first report was uh, fairly widespread. And from interest in the last couple weeks, it looks like the new report will be uh, an, a success as well. The Tucker Center, on average, gets about 600 hits per day on our website. When we launched the official report last Monday, the Tucker Center website registered about 8,500 hits, and now we're registering about 3,200 per day. So it's really exciting to officially launch the report and get it into your hands and the hands of others that can really use the information to make a difference in the lives of girls. So what I'd like to do first before we get started is set the stage for what we mean by physical activity. Briefly define physical activity as a substantial physical effort. Now I know that's not a super academic definition and some of you have maybe different definitions of substantial, but we know that there's a continuum of physical activity that on either end has negative consequences. So on one hand, we have overtraining and too much physical activity that might lead to injury. On the other end, we have complete physical inactivity that can perhaps lead to obesity. So what we want to do in this report, and one of our goals was to outline an optimal and healthy amount in terms of frequency, intensity, and duration that leads to optimal health and well-being for girls. And what we found was that in reviewing the literature that girls indeed participate through a wide range of physical activities from organized sport to physical education to leisure time. And when they do participate, they have developmental benefits in terms of making friends and motor skills and health benefits in terms of reducing risk for chronic disease that we'll hear about later. But we also found by re reviewing the research that there were three major trends that emerged, and there was a good news, bad news that, that people have been asking us about. So I want to review those three trends. The first trend, the good news, is that girls are participating in organized sport more than ever before, from the youth level to the interscholastic level up through the intercollegiate level. And indeed, one in three girls currently participates in organized sport. And that number is up from pre-Title IX in 1972 when it was one in 27 girls. And as, as Dr. Kane likes to say, um, we've in one generation, we've gone from girls who hope there was a team to girls hoping they'll make the team. And so this is the real good news. However, if one girl is participating in organized sport, the second girl is barely meeting physical activity standards necessary to accrue health benefits. And the third girl is completely sedentary. <laughs> Which leads me to our second major trend is that outside of organized sports, nearly half of young people are not moderately or, vis or vigorously active, and this is especially true for girls. And we know from childhood through adolescence that girls' physical activity declines. And if they're not active in adolescence, it's very unlikely they'll become active adults. And 
So our second trend is that outside of organized sport, girls are less physically active. And we know this is particularly true for girls um, of ethnically and racially diverse uh, girls and that for girls of low socioeconomic families. So while some girls participate in sports in record numbers, a majority of girls are minimally physically active. And the third and final trend, and one that's been getting a lot of attention in the media, is the fact that uh, compared to boys, girls are less physically active. And this is across all ages, ethnicities, and physical activities. So we know that in interscholastic sports, boys outnumber girls five to three, and that girls drop out earlier and in greater numbers than do boys. Girls are also less likely to be in physical education, and they're also less likely to be in daily physical education. So there's this good news, bad news in terms of girls' physical activity. So what we tried to do in this report, and uh, the question that's been getting asked a lot is, well, what's going on? Why is this happening? And the bigger question is, what can we do about it? So in the report, we really try to detail and explain the complex set of barriers that girls face from poverty to inequitable funding, to family values, to stereotypes um, that girls aren't as interested in boys as sports. And all these barriers contribute to the fact that there is a gender gap in physical activity that limits girls' participation. However, we, as Dr. Kane mentioned, we also try to address this in terms of best practices that we'll get to at the end of the presentation. So I'll now turn it over to uh, Dr. Barbara Ainsworth, who will summarize the physiological dimensions. I can't, I can't tell you what an honor it is for me to be back at the University of Minnesota where I received my uh, graduate education and I came to Minnesota for one year and stayed for 15. <laughs> so it, it's, it, 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 it becomes part of you. Um, okay, I had a, a chapter that was very, very enjoyable to write and I'd like to recognize my co-authors, Jean Nichols, who I worked with at San Diego State with briefly, and my current postdoc, Kelly Petty, who will now join the uh, medical school and at the University of Nebraska in Omaha. So very pleased to, to send someone back to the Midwest. Uh, today I will be uh, touching briefly on the following topics that you can read on the screen. Cardiorespiratory fitness, muscular strength and power, chronic disease prevention, menarche, bone health, the female athlete triad. These are key areas of research in the past 10 years since the first report that has had a, a, a great deal of uh, research and, and updated information that we would like to include in the report. Um, in terms of cardiorespiratory fitness, much of the new levels of uh, information, let me just put all this out here on the, um, out on the uh, screen for us here. Because what I wanted to start with, and first of all saying, is that cardiorespiratory fitness is, is associated with increased longevity, and that it's uh, associated also with weight maintenance. And probably for youth, and especially for girls, weight Physical activity is critical in helping maintain weight. And for many of the health outcomes that we talk about today, uh, overweight and uh, at risk for overweight in young girls is, is a constant theme that relates to uh, adverse health outcomes. The benefits for, uh, uh, of cardiorespiratory fitness is that there's a lower risk of developing diabetes. There's a lower risk of developing heart disease. And there's a lower risk in adults for developing colon and breast cancer. Now, this is, these are important conditions for uh, youth because many of these diseases start in youth and it takes a long time for them to develop until they become a parent in uh, adulthood. Uh, in 1999, 2000, I should say 2002 actually, there was very important uh, report data collected from the National Health and Nutrition and Examination Survey that we call NHANES. And in this population-based study, they uh, performed treadmill testing on uh, children, adolescents, and adults. And among the youth that were between the ages of 12 to 19, 
they were able to measure their uh, treadmill performance and estimate their maximal oxygen uptake, which is the, the best index of fitness you can find. And looking at the 50th percentile scores for girls by age, um, as the girls grew older, there was a progressive decline in their aerobic power. And this is very important because uh, for girls through their middle teen years, there's the um, decrease in physical activity still, and there's a decrease in aerobic fitness, which has important health outcomes because higher levels of physical fitness and higher levels of physical activity is, is important for weight maintenance. And that was the w overweight and low fitness is so important with uh, uh, health outcomes. For muscular strength and power, uh, is defined as the ability to generate force. And we have muscular endurance, muscular power, and uh, regular old uh, muscular strength. And that there is evidence that having greater muscular strength and endurance is related to uh, having lower levels of chronic disease. It's important for uh, maintaining uh, numerous health benefits mostly including weight control because of the increased amount of muscle mass and chronic, chronic disease prevention because uh, the, the, you have a better metabolism and more efficient use of your fuel that you take in through uh, diet and eating and better use of your insulin and glucose. Muscular strength and power increases through puberty uh, it's for girls, but as they uh, age and go through 12 to 19 years, those who become less active and are sedentary see a, a decrease in strength and power. And of course, those who maintain activity uh, through puberty and even become more active see stronger increases in strength and power, hence uh, health benefits. For chronic disease prevention, uh, some of the results from the NHANES study that I reported on earlier uh, shows the relationships between physical fitness and some of the risk factors for chronic diseases. Among type 2 diabetes, almost half of the new cases um, are um, within young people. And that of these people who have uh, type 2 diabetes, about 85% are overweight. And many are inactive and sedentary. For other cardiovascular disease risk factors, the, Dr. Mercedes Carthenon from Northwestern University analyzed the NHANES data with the same fitness data that was shown before and uh, showed that among compared those with higher fitness and those with lower fitness for their levels of uh, overweight and obese, hypertension, high glucose, low HDL cholesterol, uh, impaired fasting glucose, and the metabolic syndrome, which is a cascade of these um, conditions, and showed that if you see the little circle with the line through it, and if it doesn't cross through that middle line, there's a significant increase um, in the condition on the left for those who are low fit compared to high fit people. So for girls uh, who are overweight, they are twice as likely to have low physical fitness than those who have high fitness. And same for those who are obese. And those girls that have high glucose, which is a precursor of type 2 diabetes, they are about one and a half times more likely to be low fitness than those who are high fit. Now, many of the other sim symptoms that, are, that have the line that their, their long horizontal line crosses the middle line means that they are not independently significant, but they are on track for uh, being predictive. For, so for low fitness is an indicator for uh, the risks for having risk factors for future diseases in these girls. Uh, thinking about the onset of the men menses or menarche, for most gals, it's about 12.4 years. In the past 10 years, there has been a, a good amount of research that has uh, showed that, that menarche is often delayed in active girls. And they used to think this was due to the high amount of intense exercise, um, but it's now more associated with low amounts of energy intake. And there's a risk of menstrual dysfunction uh, when the onset of uh, menstruation is later and also for active girls. Early puberty um, is associated, so these are the gals who are um, uh, having the 
often inactive but often have the menarche before 12 point years, is associated with weight gain. Uh, different concerning behaviors such as um, uh, abuse of smoking and drinking, and that the body satisfaction is higher among young girls who are achieving the uh, puberty before 12.4 years. And we often see eating disorders in these gals because of the uh, pressure to be thin uh, during the young teenage years. The, uh, so, so the lack of activity uh, and uh, overweight is also has been shown to be related to the early puberty. In terms of bone health, since 1997, there has been a uh, considerable amount of evidence that shows that the teenage years is the most important time to gain bone mass. And in fact, 11 to 14 years of age is the greatest amount, has the greatest amount of, of bone development for a growing skeleton. By 17 years of age, a young female has 90% of her total bone mass accumulated and that uh, if the diet is uh, insufficient, the energy intake is low, uh, that their c gals could be at risk for having uh, entering adulthood with inadequate bone health. Now, why is this important? Because as you become older, your bone declines. And so it's important to enter adulthood with the highest amount of bone mass that you can. Now, to improve the bone health and optimize bone health, you need three things. You need to have sun exposure or vitamin D. Drinking milk fortified with vitamin D is, uh, is sufficient. You need to have at least 1,300 milligrams per day in the diet of calcium. And many young uh, gals do not achieve this amount of calcium in the diet. And you need to be physically active. Being physically active is important for optimizing bone health. But if you are physically active and you get optimum calcium, the strength of the bones and the, and the uh, ma mass of the bones is the greatest. So these are three important things. How much activity? 30 minutes is good, 45 minutes is better, and 60 minutes per day is optimal. The female athlete triad is a concern, as uh, Nicole mentioned, uh, about the overuse or the abuses that could occur when young females have too much activity, their eating is disordered, and there is an accompanying menstrual dysfunction uh, due to the interruption with the, uh, the female hormones. Disordered eating occurs when a person is not having enough food, not eating the right types of meals, or is experiencing bulimia or anorexia or some sort of weight control mechanisms. Among athletes, it's been estimated that at least 15 to 62 percent of females admit at some time in their period of uh, competition that they have engaged in disordered eating practices. In the general population, this value is much less, between 13 and 20 percent. Menstrual dysfunction, as we mentioned before, often accompanies intense uh, ex exercise and is more associated with inadequate energy intake as a way to preserve the body's function. Uh, if one does not have menses by age 15 years, it's considered to be menstrual dysfunction. And if the menses are irregular, that's also a menstrual dysfunction uh, uh, case. The low bone mass, as I mentioned just before, is, uh, is associated with poor calcium, lack of physical activity, and low vitamin D. And among the female athletes, 22% of the, those in, in competitive sports are not accruing the bone as expected. So these young gals are entering adulthood at risk. Uh, these are, these are, this is an important condition that has been studied quite a bit. So in the last 10 years, a revaluation of the research concerning young girls in sport and in physical activity have highlighted these following um, topics that I just mentioned. I thank you, and now I turn you over to Dr. Margaret Duncan. Good 
the major sociocultural finding of the 1997 report was that the most significant barrier to physical activity for girls is conventional gender expectations. Ten years later, the barrier remains unchanged. Girls are still encouraged to be feminine, to be quiet, ladylike, and inactive, to take up less space than boys, to restrain their gestures and physical exuberance, and to put sport participation on the back burner once they reach puberty. In 2007, one of the major findings is that these gender expectations are built into the typical PE curriculum at school, as well as uh, in recreational sports practices. The other major finding relates to the surveillance and objectification of female bodies. But let's start with the um, PE curriculum. Physical educators have called girls' alienation from physical activity the problem with girls and have attributed the problem to laziness, stubbornness, or lack of interest. However, researchers in physical activity pedagogy offer a more likely explanation. This problem lies not with in individual girls, but rather with our gender order which produces and reproduces conven conventional femininities. Researchers call what happens in PE classes the hidden curriculum, which functions to privilege boys and to disadvantage girls. Let's take a look at what actually happens during physical education. The typical approach is a multi-activity curriculum that consists of short units uh, spent on one sport before switching to a new sport. Almost always these are team sports, usually those that capitalize on male attributes of power, strength, aggression, and size. Sports in which girls have the disadvantage, excuse me, sports in which girls have the advantage, those that emphasize agility and endurance, for example, are rarely part of the PE curriculum. There is little actual instruction because teachers assume that most kids are already skilled and those with the greatest skill are rewarded with maximum attention and playing time. However, this basic assumption is flawed. Kids have different levels of skills and ability. Due to the way that girls are socialized in this culture, girls often have less sport experience than boys. So teachers tend to skimp on skills mastery and focus on competition, usually in the form of tournaments. When there is instruction, it consists of weak educational sequences across units, little emphasis on using skills strategically, few policies for equalizing playing opportunities for less skilled players, required public displays of playing ability, and class control exercise by the teacher, minimizing student ownership and leadership opportunities, especially in large classes. It is little wonder that girls believe that PE is not for them. Whoops, I'm a little behind here, sorry about that. Whoops, how did that happen? Uh, let's see, okay, here we go. <laughs> it is a little wonder that girls believe that PE is not for them. Ethnographic studies suggest that PE teachers show preferences for boys, that they construct special rules for girls based on their presumed inferiority, limit the number of girls who can play, give girls less activity time and playing space, uh, humiliate, whoops, excuse me, uh, designate boys as captain of, captains of teams, allowing them to pick their own team members, and you know how that goes, humiliate girls and less skilled boys, 
when they make errors, divide kids by gender for skills instruction and practice when it does occur, and model gender typical roles. Boys also participate in the hidden curriculum by controlling play, refusing to pass to girls, ignoring girls, and embracing a win at all costs ethic. These findings cut across race, class, region, nationality, and apply to community organized athletics as well. Clearly, girls are not the problem. The gender order is, how can we design girl-friendly physical activity programs? First, girls themselves should guide the selection of movement activities. Listening to girls' needs and desires is paramount. There, there are, however, some basic assumptions or some basic principles. Girls should be exposed to a large range of early movement activities that serve as a base for more complex physical pursuits. Learning to throw, kick, hit, strike, um, for example, would be useful. Learning how to swim, to move the body in aesthetically pleasing ways, to build strength and endurance, and to defend oneself would also be important. Learning about nutrition, relaxation, and stress management are additional possibilities. Another key component is acquiring skills for lifelong leisure pursuits. So that would be things like tennis, golf, jogging, aerobics, swimming, dance, and so on. Changing the physical activity climate should also be a focus. It would be important to motivate kids by emphasizing sports intrinsic qualities, fun, pleasure, challenge, self-knowledge, to reward kids for improvement and effort in addition to ability, to provide specific feedback related to kids' performance of the physical activity uh, task and to create a safe accepting environment, one in which girls are neither ignored nor ridiculed for poor athletic performances. A second finding from the 2007 report is not a curricular activity or, or issue at all. Indeed, and instead, it is a larger social issue, the surveillance and objectification of female bodies. These practices flow again from our gender order and the emphasis on conventional gender roles. Here I will be discussing the impact of the popular media on beauty ideals for girls. No age group is more focused on bodies and appearances than adolescent girls. From the moment they are born, they are told in a thousand different ways that they are valued primarily for their appearance rather than for their achievements. The popular media suggests that the beauty ideal in our culture is a white girl or woman with blonde hair, blue eyes, flawless features, an extremely slender, toned and taut body, full breasts, tiny waist, long legs, and narrow boyish hips. I've just described Barbie. Um, <laughs> Girls learn about this beauty ideal from a young age, as soon as they are given Barbies or other dolls, and coloring books exposed to television, magazines, movies, radio, and books. They're also taught by our commodity culture that it is every girl's individual responsibility to become perfectly thin and perfectly beautiful, and that her figure and facial flaws um, must be overcome by purchasing beauty and diet products. During adolescence, the pressures to conform to the dominant feminine ideal increase um, as teenage peers strictly patrol the boundaries of gender. Taking their cues from stereotypical portrayals of athletes in the media, adolescents may gender type physical activity perceiving certain sports as appropriate only for girls and other sports as appropriate only for boys. Often girls will choose the activities that build on ideal femininity. So uh, gymnastics, figure skating, diving, cheerleading, and dance. As girls become more preoccupied with the way that they look, the surveillance of their body increases and routinely occurs in sport and activity settings. Girls may feel particularly vulnerable because their bodies may be more exposed in shorts, t-shirts, and bathing suits than in street clothing. 
the media focus on uh, young women's bodies in various states of undress, and both kids and adults become accustomed to gazing at and evaluating female figures. It is hardly surprising then that girls report that their peers and other adults watch and comment on their bodies and particularly their bodily deficiencies. Girls are aware of this gaze and know that it is often sexual. To cope with the sense of being on display, girls may develop avoidance strategies, such as avoiding public swimming pools, exercising during unpopular times when there are fewer people about, or worse yet, shunning physical activity entirely. This surveillance is a logical expression of a gender order that is potentially damaging both physically and emotionally to girls. Furthermore, when race and class are factored into the equation, the consequences of surveillance may be qualitatively different and more oppressive when girls are also members of non-dominant cultural groups. Girls of color are placed in an impossible position since African-American, Asian-American, Latino, and Mexican-American girls do not resemble this beauty uh, ideal, nor will they ever. That is the white beauty ideal. How can parents, educators, and coaches help girls challenge the sexualization and surveillance of female bodies in our society? Many experts believe that girls and boys need lessons in critical reflection and cultural media literacy. This means teaching kids to critique the public discourse, the limiting and oppressive messages about gender and femininity that shape girls' everyday experience of their bodies. Both boys and girls need to understand the profit-driven purposes of the beauty, fashion, diet industries, and the embedded messages they produce. All forms of media should be addressed, including television, videos, movies, magazines, music, and the internet. Cultural media literacy should start in primary school. The lower grades are not too early to introduce kids to advertising and the role that it plays in our culture. Children must also learn that the white beauty ideal based on a narrowly defined look, is sexist, racist, and classist if applied to every woman. Experts in pedagogy also believe that sport and physical education classes should directly address girls' experiences of their bodies, a topic that is largely neglected in most educational settings. Some key questions might include how girls who play sports feel about their bodies, how girls who play sports are represented in culture, and how girls who, reg who exercise regularly feel about themselves. Another important question would be why certain activities may be empowering for one gender while simultaneously disempowering for another. Getting children to think critically about the gender order will take time, effort, and persistence, but it is not an impossible task. An empowering sporting environment provides many social awards, rewards, maybe awards too. Um, certainly, a knowledge of one's body is critical to the work of adolescents um, in the development of identity. Many girls gain self-knowledge by testing their limits in sport and physical activity. Participation in athletics provides unambiguous, reliable feedback about one's skills, something rarely experienced in other spheres of life. Another social benefit of sport participation is the camaraderie, being part of a group with a higher goal, making friends and, or maintaining friendships. As individuals, girls may derive real satisfaction from their own physical mastery. Further, knowing that one is sufficiently strong and capable to overcome stereotypical social constructions of femininity is fragile, helpless, and limited, can be an empowering experience in itself. And as mentioned earlier, perhaps the greatest pleasure that girls can experience comes from the intrinsic rewards of sport and physical activity, fun, pleasure, and so on. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> um, much of this, I actually I think I go on to the next one. 
Much of this talk has presented a rationale for severing the link between femininity and physical activity. In closing, I would like to touch on some recent developments that make girls' participation in sports and, and physical activity even more important. important. And here, uh, my talk will be uh, resonating with, with Dr. Ainsworth's um, address. That is the increasing levels of overweight and obesity in children and youth. By now, we all know the health consequences of this problem. However, what have been less talked about are the social consequences. Children have identified the major outcome of, of overweight and obesity to be social discrimination. Regrettably, our culture views overweight and obesity as a moral failing. Kids can be cruel, and one of the unfortunate targets of this cruelty is overweight and obese kids. Other children may taunt, abuse, or ostracize their overweight classmates. The social costs, low self-esteem and depression, are too high for anyone, much less a child, to have to pay. Physical activity plays a key role in helping children and teens to maintain a healthy weight. In some cases, the only exercise kids get is during physical ed education or community sports. When those options are foreclosed, the results are predictable. Children become overweight or obese. The significance of severing the link between femininity and physical activity stands out in especially sharp relief against the epidemic, uh, whoops, against the epidemic of overweight and obesity. In sum, we need to start thinking about the gender order, girls' health, and their physical activity participation in new, ra in new ways. Thank you very much. My head coach, Dr. Mary Jo Kane, has threatened, we, threatened me with having to run extra laps after the session tonight if I go overtime. So I did bring my stopwatch <laughs> to keep myself on time. In spite of that threat, I am delighted to be here to talk with you today <laughs> about the psychological dimensions in particular and about a couple of other tasks that I've been assigned. So first, let me talk with you about a summary of my findings relative to the psychological dimensions of girls' physical activity participation. And these are reported in chapter two of the Tucker Center report. Let me define for you what my thinking was going into this chapter about how I might identify the areas that I was going to address and not overlap too much with the issues that Margaret, for example, might address in, in her report. And so in my mind, when I think about psychological dimensions, I'm thinking about the thoughts, feelings, and actions of girls in physical activity contexts. And the second piece that I was thinking about as I was searching for literature and writing the report is to think about the reciprocal influence that occurs, both in terms of what girls and their psychology that comes with them bring to physical activity contexts, and in turn, what kinds of psychological effects those physical activity contexts have on the girls. So there's a reciprocal kind of influence there. And in the brief time that I have with you, I'll be talking about and highlighting just a few examples of the kinds of things that I write about in the report, and you can find more details about any of these in the actual report itself. And the second thing I've done in the next few slides is to use what I would call a question-based approach. I think a lot about, I think as Nicole and I have talked over the kinds of questions that we're getting about the report, I think a lot of people ask questions, and so here are some maybe basic psychological answers to questions that we have about girls in, in physical activity and the psychology involved. So first, let's think about cognitions or the thoughts that girls have and some of their beliefs and values about physical activity. One question we might ask, for example, is to say, are girls interested in sport, or are they as interested as boys? And one of our earlier speakers raised this. And these are very important uh, qualities or thoughts or cognitions to consider because they do have a lot of influence on what girls actually do in physical activity contexts. And so what I found in my general read of the literature is that um, girls 
are very interested in physical activity, but what I have more so than boys what I would call a balanced view of physical activity and sport. They value it and are interested in it, but they see it as equitable to other areas of achievement and domains of interest they, that they might uh, pursue in, in terms of the academic pursuits and so on. So that yes, they are interested in sport, but they see it as somewhat less important, if you will, in their lives than do boys. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. One can overvalue one domain over the other, but we certainly want them to value it sufficiently to seek out these and achieve these optimal levels of participation that we've talked about. A second question you might ask in the area of cognitions or thoughts that girls have is why do girls participate? And earlier, Dr. Kane introduced one of my colleagues and actually my mentor, Dr. Maureen Weiss, the co-director of the Tucker Center, and Dr. Weiss and her students have certainly been leaders in the area of doing research in this particular area. And this asked the question about why do youth in general uh, and participate in sport and then um, what gender differences might there be? I guess my basic answer is I don't see tremendous gender differences. I'm always thinking about, in my opinion, I think girls and boys are a lot more alike than they are different, and I, I think that's a good thing. I think, in general, they want and value the same things out of sport. Their profiles might look a little bit different, but it's, I think that's a good news situation, that we have all kinds of information about how to advantage girls and boys through sport participation. So youth participate in sport, according to Dr. Weiss's work and that of others, for three major reasons, as you see on the screen. And again, in the interest of time, I won't go into details about all of these. But in turn, kids also drop out of sport for the converse reasons. So if they're not having fun, they're not having chance to develop physical competence, they're not enjoying themselves, as Margaret just spoke about, not feeling socially accepted. And a, an additional category that shows up is being harmed in some way. And this includes both physical harm and psychological or social harm. So those are reasons that girls might not want to participate or might drop out once they join. Another question we might ask relative to thoughts and belief systems is how competent do girls feel, or perhaps I should have said, if I could change my slide now, how competent do girls think they are relative to their physical capabilities? And the answer to my question is that there are both age and gender-related factors to think about in terms of what the evidence shows us here. In general, any of you who have worked with young children know they're very optimistic and enthusiastic about their potential and their possibilities. Not always realistic, but certainly enthusiastic and optimistic. But in terms of gender, the sort of discouraging finding is still, even in the last 10 years worth of literature that I looked at, the general finding is that girls throughout the childhood and adolescent years uh, see themselves as less physically competent than do boys. So that's a belief that we have to be aware of when we're working with girls. A second category that we might consider in terms of my definition of psychological dimensions is the category of affect or emotional involvement in physical activity. So what are the some of the feelings associated with physical activity for, uh, for girls? So a question we might ask is do girls enjoy physical activity? And in general, my read is yes, and I think one of the problems I, that we need to deal with as professionals working with young girls and boys for that matter is that we somehow stifle this early childhood love of physical activity that most kids very naturally have. So we're doing something round about those middle school years or during those early years and, and it, it comes to a head at the middle school years that we've caused them to not enjoy it quite as much. And so that's something I would say that we need to certainly look at from an emotional standpoint. But fun and enjoyment are clearly the major reasons that girls participate in sport and physical activity. But again, I would, uh, my caveat here, I guess, would be to say that enjoyment and fun is a complex sort of construct. It's not as simple as it might sound to, you know, throw out the ball and everyone goof off and do whatever. That's not the case. There are lots of factors, and you can see several of them listed on the screen, that make up this construct of enjoyment or fun. And again, the evidence bears this out. So there are many enjoyable aspects about sport and physical activity for girls. And again, Dr. Weiss's work and the work of others, such as Tara Scanlon, would show us that enjoyment is very much linked to sport commitment. So if you're thinking about girls that we want to get committed to sport and physical activity, enjoyment is central to that uh, connection, that long-term commitment. Another piece rel relative a little bit more to personality, but certainly something that I think we can work on as professionals with young athletes and young 
uh, phys physically active girls, not just athletes, is to help them as persons focus more on achieving tasks and achieving the goals associated with developing skills and so forth, rather than a heavy emphasis on competition and exclusion. So certainly, yes, girls enjoy physical activity. I did not see any evidence of, in the literature that tells us that girls don't enjoy and value physical activity. On the converse side, from an, still in this broad category of emotions and affect, there are certainly in the literature, there, unfortunately, I think, as sports psychologists, we've written a lot more about the negative affect associated with physical activity in sport than we have about positive affect. So that's certainly one general finding. But, uh, and I, but I'd be remiss if I didn't talk a little bit about negative affect, because it also informs us as to how we might better work with girls. So just for example, one of the negative pieces is, the, is in the area of anxiety. And um, in terms of state anxiety or how anxious a particular girl might feel in a particular situation, not just a sports situation, but a physical education class, for example, that Margaret described, there are certainly several personal characteristics and situational characteristics, as you can see on the screen, that gives you a snapshot of the kinds of factors that are related to girls feeling anxious in a particular physical activity situation. And again, knowing that helps us to do something about it. Uh, particularly at risk are the girls, such as Margaret described, that are low self-esteem, low, low perceptions of competence, and then you put them in a high anxiety-producing situation with a coach who's you know, putting a lot of pressure, or has a negative style, or even a physical education teacher who structures a very competitive classroom. And I think, again, the psychological findings are very consistent with what Margaret has spoken about. In terms of burnout, it's just an example of another negative consequence of participation. It's just a longer term uh, state rather than uh, a state, of, a current state anxiety situation. But again, we have to be aware of the fact that more is not always better, for example, when it comes to physical activity participation. Um, a few other just brief examples of cognitive and emotional benefits, and I'm making sort of an arbitrary distinction that shouldn't be there. Cognitions and affect are integrally tied to one another as they are tied to behavior. So this is just for helping me keep my points straight for you and in trying to write this up. But certainly from a broad-based mental health standpoint, physical activity is a benefit to mental health, so it's just a good stress reduction, sort of proactive approach for girls. Secondly, for girls that might be in treatment for clinical kinds of uh, disorders such as depression or anxiety, in many cases, uh, fit moderate participation in physical activity is a valuable asset or an adjunct to their treatments and their therapies. It wouldn't replace traditional therapies, but in, in addition to, certainly has benefits for the girls. And then a final example would be, I'm really excited about kind of the, some of the current research, and we just had a call for proposals come out, I believe from NASPI, one of our professional organizations, about research looking at cognitive functioning, and just generally schools, for example, eliminating recess and eliminating eliminating physical activity opportunities during a school day. And I say this as a parent, I, I'll fight to the death to keep recess and things in my kids' schools because it's so important on multiple levels, not just for the physical activity benefits that we're talking about, but in terms of cognitive functioning. So certainly the evidence is, is illustrating that for us too. In terms of the second half of my definition about reciprocal influences, let me just tell you about a few things relative to the social climates that are created in physical activity contexts and how those affect girls. And I expect we might have some parents in the audience tonight. So this is the sidelines at one of my son's soccer games. Very typical, any of you who've watched youth soccer, that's what it might look like. Um, fathers, we have some fathers in the audience tonight. You are very, very important and influential in terms of your daughter's physical activity participation. And we want to use that to advantage girls. So again, the evidence would tell me that fathers are particularly influ influential in um, influencing, I guess, girls' perceptions of competence and how much they value uh, physical activity in their lives. Secondly, I want to alert you fathers, or those of you that have influence on fathers, that the type of influence makes a difference to the girl. So for example, again, back to some of Dr. Weiss's work and her work with one of her students, uh, a study of female soccer players, it was clearly found that these soccer players were psychologically advantaged by having fathers that were involved. They want you there, they want you involved, but not pressuring. And so again, the evidence tells us things about, really in general, kids do want parents at sporting events and in other contests, 
but there's a, a very well-defined role as far as what we can do to advantage the kids and not cause negative consequences. And the other thing about fathers is that more typically the research evidence tells us that they more typically take an active role, more likely to be a coach, more likely to be physically active themselves, and those are good things. We want you to keep doing that. However, when we talk about mothers in a moment, I have some, I have, I'm going to come back to fathers just for a quick comment. So moms, I am one. I'm, I'm hoping there are more of you out there. We, uh, I can relate to this, we're most often the ones to sign the kids up, sign our daughters up, enroll her in programs. We're also most commonly the ones to provide logistical support. So buy the shoes, <laughs> bring the snacks, uh, all of those things, you know, does the uniform fit? Is it washed? All of that. So we engage in significantly more support. Very important. <laughs> um, but girls want active female role models. So my, my point would be, moms don't stop doing that. Dads don't stop doing what you do, but switch off roles a bit. Give moms a chance to take that more active role. Dads, in order for you to do that, we need you. And I say this as uh, having a husband around. Uh, I want you to do more of the housework and wash the uniforms and do some of that so that I can coach. I need that time. And vice versa. You know, we need to support each other in that or partners or spouses and so on. So girls want and need both parents is my point as much as they have those accessible to them. Now... I've been sitting here looking at you for all for quite a while, and I'm getting a little bit disgusted. <laughs> and if you don't shape up, you're going to have to run some extra laps with me after the talk tonight. <laughs> that, obviously, would not be a very good leader climate for me to create. <laughs> and so, in terms of the climates that various ki kinds of leaders, coaches, physical education teachers create, don't do what I just did. That's not advantageous to kids. And the evidence clearly shows us that there are undesirable psychological consequences associated with punishment, excessive use of punishment. There's a time and a place, but minimal is fine. Favoritism, excessive competition, very negative style. Those are not good things for girls, or I would argue for boys as well. What we should do is be more task involving. Again, this is derived from, from the literature. In terms of task-involving climates, what we're looking for is leaders, physical education teachers, coaches, recreation leaders, you young professionals that are going to be recreation leaders, support improvement, effort, create positive peer relationships, truly believe and value all of the athletes and, and participant on your teams and participants in your programs. And the reason is, multiple reasons, but relative to psychology, these kinds of leader behaviors are associated with many desirable psychological outcomes. So create good climates for the, for the uh, girls that you work with. Finally, peers. I know we have lots of students here. We maybe have some young people too. We have a lot of college women and men. And uh, peer climates are terribly important. So for example, I keep talking about Dr. Weiss, but I, half my report really used her research. So <laughs> she's a great one to ask questions of afterward if you, if you have some. And she's been a leader in terms of this area of sport friendships, just in, as an example of peer relationships. And these sport friendships are, f again, for girls related to many positive psychological outcomes. And some of the dimensions of these sport friendships include, uh, again, a vast list. So they're very complex and multidimensional in terms of friendships. These are good things. And in terms of just one little bit of a gender difference, again, I don't see huge differences. Maybe Dr. Weiss feels differently, but I don't see huge differences between the genders. But if anything, the girls a little bit more so talk about wanting supportiveness and connectedness in their of sport friendships. Now, it could be that boys just don't want to talk about it or don't admit it too, but uh, girls certainly do value those qualities. So peers, some general thoughts, not specific to competitive sport, but across physical activity situations. Clearly, young people who perceive greater support for their physical activity are more active, so you can be very supportive to each other. I know I have a daughter and a son. My daughter, for example, loves it when her non-sport um, non uh, friends come and watch her play on the volleyball team, for example. She loves that. That's very supportive to her. So again, anything you can do to support and watch each other and recognize each other's accomplishments will advantage girls' participation, again, based on what I'm seeing in the evidence. So again, just in summary, girls enjoy sport. They like sp physical activity. They learn a lot and gain a lot through properly structured climates. And we have a pretty clear idea about what it is that girls are looking for from us. 
Uh, my second task today is to set the scene for the comments that each of our speakers are going to be making relative to chapter five. So in chapter five, Nicole Lavoie and I uh, tackled the, I guess, head on, the big project of trying to make some recommendations for what to do. We really wanted this to be action oriented. And so let me give you just an overview of what's in chapter five if you look at the report. We first talk about best practices in there, and again, in a moment, each of the speakers will talk about the best practices that she would recommend from her chapter of the report. In terms of some global points, um, Nicole put this up early on, and I'd bring you back to this concept of utilizing and better utilizing multiple physical activity sources. It's sort of like, I think of it as cross-training. You know, lots of different opportunities for lots of diverse motives and interests and goals and it's phys physiologically cross-training, it's socially exposing girls to different types of settings, and so for multiple reasons, multiple physical activity sources are um, an advantage to girls. Secondly, once we get them into physical activity situations, we want to create optimal climates or contexts. And so again, we talk in chapter five, and, and each author talks about how we might use our knowledge and our evidence to create optimal contexts and reduce the barriers, which I, I know Nicole will be talking about in a minute. A third thing is that, uh, for those of you familiar or working in youth settings that are familiar with a positive youth development sort of approach to things, clearly physical activity settings are primary context for developing all aspects of the assets that youth need and girls need to live healthy lifestyles. And in particular, we're talking today and maybe highlighting the physical assets that really are un underrepresented in many models of positive youth development. So I'd encourage us to think about physical assets as just as important as other types of assets that we develop through positive youth development. And, a, and aside from that, of course, is physical activity can be used to develop psychological and social assets as well. A third thing that we do in the report is look at, a second thing actually, is to look at different types of programs. And so we have, this is just an example, I'm not gonna talk about these, but just to give you a flavor for the kinds of programs that we talk about in there, what Nicole and I tried to look at or were more national scale programs and programs for the most part that had some sort of evidence-based research to show us whether or not that program was effective or not. So again, we mean, we mean no disrespect to others of you that are working with wonderful programs. We just provided again an overview or a snapshot of different types of programs. A third thing that we did was look at policies and future research, and again, my goal tonight, since we uh, don't have lots of time for any of these pieces, is to give you a flavor for what you will find in there. And so relative to policies, for example, we write a little bit about some of the current legislation underway. We write about reports, other reports that you might want to look at, conferences and summits that are, um, that have been held relative to girls' physical activity or physical activity in general. We also, each of our authors was kind enough to give us some future research directions, and those are incorporated into the report. So for you young scholars, you graduate students out there, there's a whole list of possible research topics that we need your help with. And then finally, not sure if it appears that way in the chapter, but finally, Nicole and I worked really hard to capture in one graphic or schematic a kind of look at what a dream program would look like. How could we develop physically active girls using what we know from these evidence-based chapters? And copies of this uh, slide or this model will be available in the lobby afterwards and it's also available on the Tucker Center website. And so with that, the next task, my third task, I'm just gonna keep going since I'm here, it'll minimize transition time, is to tell you just in two minutes about um, three or four key best practices or implications from my psychology chapter, and then I'll ask our other authors to do the same. The first is that to say that uh, clearly from the psychology chapter, the better job we can do of matching the opportunities and programs that we offer to the motives and goals and beliefs and values of the girls, the better off we'll be in terms of advantaging participation. Uh, the second thing, I mentioned this earlier, but just to restate, it's very clear to me that task mastery climates are are very much an advantage to girls. So anything that we can do to train our coaches, to train our physical activity leaders, to use task ma mastery styles of teaching that advantage girls, the better off we will be. 
A third thing is to use whatever strategies we can to generate positive thoughts and feelings about physical activity, to, make, uh, to generate enthusiasm for and love for physical activity, and to create situations that girls want to come to, that you know, they want to return to once they've been there. And then finally, uh, Nicole alluded to this earlier, but I really, it was clear to me from my chapter that there is this continuum of participation and that either end of that continuum from sedentary underactivity to what I would call health risking overactivity, either of those is not good or not healthy from a psychological standpoint. And with that, I'll turn the mic over, or I guess to Dr. Barbara Ainsworth to give a couple of minutes of comments relative to her chapter. Thank you very much. What, what a wonderful agenda for uh, improving the lives of young gals. In referring to the physiological and the metabolic best practices, uh, this may be nothing new since many of us know about the importance of regular daily physical activity for health. It's important to improve cardiorespiratory fitness for young girls by providing activities and opportunities for them to engage in at least 30 to 60 minutes of physical activity per day. 60 minutes is uh, optimal, and that's what many of the recommendations uh, call for, for moderate to vigorous intensity activity. But 60 minutes may be difficult for young gals, and so 30 minutes is a minimum for uh, adolescents to uh, become physically active five to seven days per week, which means just about every day of the week, try to encourage young gals to get out of the house, turn off the television, and become physically active. That will improve cardiorespiratory fitness. To uh, add to these bone health strength, out of those five, six, seven days a week, make three of those days some sort of activities that include jumping or high impact activities that are weight bearing. This is important to improve the response of the bone to increase its mass and its density. 10 to 30 minutes a day, three times a week, has been found to be sufficient to optimize the amount of mass that is in the bone. And remember, by 19, years old, about 90% of all the bone females will have, will have been gained. So you don't want to in, enter adulthood without having optimal bone, or else you might be uh, at risk for osteoporosis uh, by the 40s or the 50s uh, years of old. Muscular strength is a very important um, uh, type of activity, and it's been found to be safe for young uh, girls and adolescents approximately one to two days a week. About 13 to 16 repetitions for an exercise is safe. Uh, some recommendations recommend anywhere from one to 16 repetitions is helpful. And it is true that, that something is better than nothing. But this type of muscular strength doesn't have to be in the weight room. We've, we've created a generation who thinks they have to belong to a 24-hour fitness or uh, somewhere to, to become physically active. There's a number of ways to, to improve muscular strength. Calisthenics, push-ups, sit-ups, chin-ups, fitness games, uh, sports, recreation opportunities. This Minneapolis is one of the best places for recreation uh, anywhere in the, um, the U United States and certainly within the world. To avoid the risk for the, the, the athletic triad, it's important to have good communication with young and adolescent girls. Uh, to uh, talk about what is regular menses and what is irregular menses, and to optimize the di optimal diet, and, and to, uh, to try to downplay the need for this excessive thinness. The, um, the dieting is, is Adolescence is not a time to, to restrict caloric intake, but to have optimal calories and to have optimal activity, which is going to counteract the uh, increase in weight and overweight that can occur uh, with um, uh, growing and, and developing through puberty. So for um, avoiding overweight, wh what's recommended? Well, less than three hours a day is optimal for improving fitness. In fact, in some of these national studies, those young girls 
who watched, had, or had screen time, not only watching TV, but were in front of screens more than three hours a day, were at higher risk for being overweight and obesity. And in fact, uh, one, a study that was just published recently here by um, uh, a Minnesota postdoc uh, showed that, that, that young children who have TVs in their bedroom are at greater risk for being overweight and obese than children do not have TVs in their bedroom. Uh, those who, children who are enrolled in physical education class are more regularly active uh, than those who do not take physical education class. And so trying to avoid sedentary behaviors by walking to school, cycling to school, those children have higher fitness levels and lower body weight and body fatness levels. And they have healthier uh, 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 metabolic pr parameters in terms of at risk for uh, uh, cardiovascular health and, and uh, diabetes. So to ultimately lay down a good foundation that is low risk for diabetes, low risk for heart disease, low risk for uh, abnormal weight gain that in adolescence that carries into adulthood, trying to find 30 to 60 minutes of moderate to vigorous intensity activities with strength training one to two days a week, and of those aerobic activities, including some weight bearing at least three days a week to lay down the bone mass, and encouraging young girls to eat a well-balanced diet. In fact, eating as a family uh, encourages weight maintenance as opposed to just eating individually well on. And keeping a very healthy weight for height ratio is, is, provides the best odds for the healthiest profile into adulthood. our outmoded ideas about appropriate gender roles provides the basis for our socio-cultural best practices. Positive gender construction, then, is the first category of practices. This means supporting uh, gender equitable policies, challenging male privilege, and building a model based on girls' strength rather than their deficits. The second category is creating a girl-friendly um, physical activity curriculum. This involves letting girls' preferences shape the selection of physical activities, providing early and frequent exposure to a large range of movement experiences, offering lifetime leisure activities, including both competitive and cooperative activities, and including longer curricular units to allow more time for skill development. The third category relates to positive and healthy body image. Here, all of the following would be, impro uh, would be important. Constructing PE or exercise in ways that limit or prevent the surveillance and sexualization of girls' bodies. Teaching girls to treat overweight classmates with respect. Encouraging girls to actively breach the limits of femininity by trying many kinds of physical activities. Teaching girls to value what their bodies can do rather than how their bodies look. Um, and finally, discussing key issues about girls' experiences of their body. The fourth category comprises effective instructional methods for motivating, teaching, and evaluating. These would include individual learning, excuse me, individualized learning um, opportunities and offering rewards for improvement and effort in addition to ability. Motivating girls by emphasizing sports intrinsic qualities, such as fun, and providing a safe, accepting client for girls to explore and to develop their movement activities. Um, the fifth category involves modeling physical activity using leaders who eliminate gender stereotypes. So you might want to have a female leader, leader who teaches the kids um, football and a male leader who teaches the kids dance. Um, the fifth uh, let's see, yes. The sixth category is teaching critical me media literacy. And the last category is promoting the social benefits of physical activity. So I'll uh, play cleanup here. And we've mentioned so many barriers over the last 
um, hour or so that you might be sitting there thinking, what can I do? <laughs> because the barriers are so complex and interwoven from the individual barriers that Diane talked about in terms of affect and cognition to the sociological and cultural barriers of outdated stereotypes and gender stereotypes that still limit girls. It could be community barriers in terms of inequitable funding and lack of offerings of things that girls enjoy or don't have access to. Uh, and it can be family barriers in terms of mothers and fathers valuing physical activity more for their sons and their daughters, not being active role models. The barriers can go on and on. And one of the questions that's come up in the last couple of weeks is, you talk about so many barriers, but where am I in this model? And, and we felt very strongly that we wanted to develop strategies that everybody in this room could at least pick one thing that they could affect change with. And I think the one that has resonated with a lot of people is um, the one that has to do around with parents and coaches and teachers, is that we've mentioned a lot about the climates that can be created by adults for uh, girls in physical activity. And I think that's the one thing that I want to leave you with, that I, all of you probably intersect with girls or young women in one way or the other, and hopefully you can take away a, a, a nugget, a critical strategy that you can immediately um, try or to affect change in the lives of girls. So what I'd like to leave you with, and then we'll open up, up for Q&A, is really a, an important message of the entire report, is that physical activity is not an add-on for girls. It should be a core value and it's necessary for the health and well-being of girls. So this gender gap that we've been talking about from the trends I outlined in the beginning to the, the best practices and the information the authors talked about is that it's a complex challenge, but it's also a really great opportunity for all the stakeholders to work together to ensure the health and well-being of girls. So thank you. Uh, before, before I open it up um, for questions, um, <clears throat> I just want to say that uh, you all did so very well, not only in terms of what you said content-wise, but in terms of staying within your time limit. So uh, <laughs> as the major coach here tonight, the lead coach, no one has to run any extra laps. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Although we don't want to associate physical activity with some sort of negative punishments, you know, so I, I anyway. Um, I also want to say the following, that uh, for those of you who have never had the um, pleasure of being tortured by going through uh, a dissertation process and receiving your PhD, um, when you are doing such a thing to become the fabulous scholars that we have here tonight, uh, it is because they were so well trained by their advisors and mentors, and we just happen to be very lucky that with everyone, with the exception of Margaret, whose I, advisor, I assume, is not in the audience tonight, right, Margaret? <laughs> Which may or may not be a good thing uh, for you. Uh, but I do want to say that uh, starting with Diane Wiesbjornstahl, she mentioned several times that her, her mentor is someone that the University of Minnesota and the School of Kinesiology just hired from the University of Virginia, and that is Mo Weiss. So how about a round of applause for Maureen Weiss? And I mentioned to you earlier that Barbara Ainsworth is a University of Minnesota alum, and she is one spectacular scholar and educator because she was trained by an equally spectacular scholar and educator, and that is Art Leon, exercise physiologist. Stand up, Art. <laughs> Don't forget Bob Surfoss. Mary Jo, Bob Surfoss. Bob, Bob Surfoss. And... Nicole Lavoy was trained by none other than that mean old coach, Diane Wiesbjornstahl. <laughs> uh, let me just share one final experience and then uh, I'll open it up. Uh, you can just ask questions directly to the panelists and I'll get off the stage. Uh, I first came to the University of Minnesota in 1989 and I wasn't quite tuned in to the whole sort of Minnesota ethic of Mm, I don't know, sort of being maybe more uh, emotionally uh, neutral. 
Uh, and uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, so anyway, I, I do research, a, a number of you know, on, uh, on uh, ways in which female athletes are portrayed uh, in the media. And in those days, I had a slide projector that I would literally take all over the world, and certainly early in the state of Minnesota. And they were some pretty brutal images of how female athletes are portrayed. I think it is infinitely better now. Anyway, in one of my very first presentations, I was in Hibbing, Minnesota, and uh, a large crowd, not unlike this crowd. And um, I was going through my slideshow, and I, I just felt like I wasn't really sort of connecting, because I didn't get sort of any sense of, you know, this is sort of outrageous. Anyway, when, when I was done, people very politely clap, uh, clap, clapped for me, and then I took questions, and the first uh, person uh, was a woman who stood up and said, this is just terrible what you've just shown us, but what I want to know is, what are we going to do about it? And I thought, which was so Minnesotan, which I totally love and have learned to embrace, but you have to understand that as an academic, especially in 1989, I was like a deer in headlights, because I was like, what are we supposed to do about it? <laughs> I'm an academic, I don't know how to do anything about anything. <laughs> So, um, but I learned a lesson driving back from Hibbing, Minnesota, and that is why it was so important to me and to every person on this stage to say, at the end of the day, what are we going to do about it? How are we going to take these unbelievably important research findings and put them to best use? And that is why I am so proud of so many things about the report, but particularly Chapter 5, Best Practices. So with that, um, thank you all, and let's take some questions. And I know that there's uh, somebody has Aaron, and others have a microphone. So um, if you just want to come down and, and just you can address the questions directly to the authors, and uh, I'm getting off the stage. Yikes! Hello, can you hear me? Hello. Can you hear me? Okay. It's working? Okay. Sorry about that. So there was a quick mention of peers, and I don't want to overplay that, but I can just tell a quick anecdote. My daughter and uh, her, her parents, my husband and I, had an argument with her about wearing her flip-flops to school today, and she said all the kids wear them. And so we tried to give her a discussion about physical activity, and she was really distraught. So. I think that even if the influences may come from the broader society, they may present themselves to kids from their peers. And so cutting to the chase, you know, what might we, what, what might we as adults do or how difficult can that be for us as adults to intervene because we're not the peers, we're not cool, and we don't understand. I can relate to all of those because I'm not cool either. I'm mom, you know. <laughs> but, you know, my, just to return an anecdote to you, um, first of all, I think it was, it's a good school policy where my kids are that flip-flops are not allowed. Yeah. yeah. It's okay. I, you know, so again, that might be something to think about that you might not have thought about before. Secondly, uh, my daughter actually... So, you know, girls wear stupid shoes. We have this conversation a lot. I mean, they, they, she's middle school age. They wear stupid shoes, basically. But my kid always wears tennis shoes. And I, I'm sort of, I hate to say this, but sometimes said, would you like a different pair of shoes also so you don't have to wear tennis shoes all the time? Because I'm trying to, you know, not make her feel like she doesn't fit in. But she's like, no, Mom, I want to wear tennis shoes so that I can run around at recess, lunch recess. She's in eighth grade still, and I'm just so proud of her because of that, but it's very rare. It's very rare. Most of the girls stand around in recess, and it frustrates her greatly. So what to do about it? Um, hopefully keep buying them and, you know, tennis shoes and getting them to wear them and getting them with a group of kids. You know, it's not that they can't wear flip-flops at other times, but during the school day, to me, uh, I don't know if your child has a chance to participate in even some outdoor time at lunch or something like that, but um, maybe that's not such a silly idea. Uh, I, and others might want to comment on that as well. That's just that's an anecdote piece for you. <laughs> Pardon me? Change the school policy and, and tr teach our own daughters. I mean, there's, you know, it's sort of like standing up to peer pressure. It's another example, I guess, I, I said without really saying it that way, but that's 
to me what it is to be willing to wear, there's lots of neat looking tennis shoes too, and to be willing to wear those and make a statement about, I am a physically active girl and any chance I get, I'm gonna have the tennis shoes on so that I can do activity, I would argue is something we should be doing as parents. And, and so I guess that's certainly to me an action strategy that if I could encourage future parents or current parents to think about, that's something good. That, again, it doesn't mean you never let her wear flip-flops, but that there's a, a time and a place for that. Others, so I'd... Sure. Um, I don't have the flip-flop issue myself, but um, I think you're right that, that peers do really exert a lot of influence um, on, uh, on kids. But sometimes it's just helpful to try to plant a seed in your daughter's mind or your son's mind and suggest to them that you may just want to think about this in a different way. And even though, you know, your son or daughter may say, well, that's ridiculous. Um, none of my friends do that. I, I do think that, um, that teens, you know, will sort of think about it. And eventually that seed may blossom and they'll remember what you said. So that's, that's my suggestion. Do it anyway. <laughs> Can I add something? Is this on? Yeah, it's on. <laughs> um, I think I I'm, uh, teach here at the university and do a lot of work with children. And I think one of the problems is around this whole notion of parents versus children, particularly during the adolescent teen years is that um, too many parents, not, I'm not saying this is you, uh, too many parents want to be their child's friend and they want to be popular too. And I think we've lost the whole notion of I am your mom and you know what? This is what you really need to do now. And I, I, and I can say that because I've heard so many stories of where the child actually like violated their curfew three or four times and they said, okay, you're grounded. And then the boy got up the next day whistling away, okay, mom, what can I do for you? And did this and lawn, you know, the laundry and the lawn. And psychologically, it's that sense, I'm looking at you, the, the, the social psych kind of thing. Mm -hmm. It's the notion of kids that when they're teens, they, they test where is mom, and, where are mom and dad now? Or where are the people that love me now? And they kind of push, you know? And there's a, and the, the, the boy that did this thing with, oh, you know, overstaying his um, time out in the evening, he really wanted mom to set some rules. He really wanted, he didn't really want to stay out, but he had that peer pressure. So the bad, goofy person is mom, but he was happy as a clam, you know? <laughs> so sometimes I think we just have to own our motherhood, fatherhood, aunthood, whatever, aunthood, um, those kinds of things. And like you were saying, you, you, it may be hard for them, but you can also, I think, um, say, you know, you just look so cool today, I love those shoes, and leave it at that, you know. Just thoughts. Well, it is on, okay. Um, I just wanted to comment, and, and you're getting comments from mothers this evening, <laughs> obviously. Yeah. I have two absolutely beautiful twin daughters who are 12 going on chronologically 13, but <laughs> psychologically I'm not sure. But, you know, I, I, I did a lot of what you said. I took them to the Y all the time for swimming lessons when they were young. I exercised regularly at the Y. We took them for walks. They had cross-country skis before they could practically walk. Um, and bicycles since, you know, they could possibly sit on one. And they were really very active girls. But this last year, they are totally disinterested in doing anything with mother. Thank you very much. And they don't want to walk the dog with me. They don't want to go to the Y with me. They don't want to go to yoga at the Y. All they're interested in is spending time with peers. And they would be delightedly happy to go to the park by themselves. And I don't know if it's... Um, I'm. A fa on the faculty here at the university, um, you know, you made some comment about um, having them walk to school. Now, maybe it's because I'm the psychiatric consultant to the program in human sexuality at the University of Minnesota, and we have an outpatient sex offender treatment program in which I deal regularly with pedophiles. I ain't going to let no girls of mine walk to school alone, <laughs> thank you very much, despite the fact that I live in Roseville, Minnesota. And I have started to let them to go to the park with their friends, but it terrifies me to let these adorable 
12 going on 13 year old girls go and walk through Central Park in Roseville by themselves because I know people that I treat in my program that live in Roseville. And I just think this is, I mean, those best practices are wonderful, but I kind of wonder what planet those best practices are going to be <laughs> implemented on because I don't see it happening in this country. I just don't see it. Well, can I comment to? Sure, um, I'd be delighted. Yeah. You know, one of the, what, your, your concerns about safety and access are, are to, for physical activity are very real. And the issue of safety comes up not only for parents of young children, but for people who live in, in uh, neighborhoods where they fear that there's high crime and, and uh, illicit activities. Uh, there are programs that parents have gotten together to form that are walking school buses or um, uh, other types of uh, situations where they, the kids are walking to school and they pick people up and the parents are accompanying them as a way to get to, to, to the school and to have the supervised um, access. There's also partnerships and communities that people are making with the, the community policing where uh, they, um, one nice anecdotal story is when I was uh, working in uh, a small town in South Carolina, there were, uh, a police lieutenant told us about two women that came to his office and said, we really want to walk around the track at the school, but we're afraid because we don't think it's very safe. And so he said, well, why don't I send a, an officer out there and sit in his car right outside the, the track while uh, you walk? And they said, okay, 4 to 5 p.m. They did that. And so they, the women would be out there walking. Well, so after a while, the, the police officer didn't show up, but the women kept walking because they were... Be they found that it was safe and it felt safe and they became part of the environment. So I think this idea that, that the community environments and the, um, the neighborhoods getting together can provide a very uh, important role in creating a, a sense of safety and access for physical activity. And this would include being at the park or being at the mall or um, uh, getting, you know, promoting ambulatory activity for, for children, and um, I would I would encourage you to to talk with you know parents of your children's friends to see if you can't uh, come up with some ideas on how to help create some some uh, feelings of safety where the kids can have choices. You know, one of the things that that I uh, heard a, um, a child psychologist uh, mention uh, was about that children like choices. And that if we offered our child uh, choices, when he, he talks about his kid going to bed and saying, well, what would you like to do first, brush your teeth or put on your pajamas? And so they were going to do both of them, but the kid had the choice of what he was going to do first. And so, you know, maybe with the flip-flops, what would you like to, you know, when would you like to wear them and, and set up situations where school is not an option or something like that. But I think that, you know, trying to work on those avenues might be fruitful. And uh, just to add, I, I hear you as a parent, and I'm looking at Sandy Peterson. And so, Sandy, tell me if you'd like rather not speak about this, and I'll say it. But uh, let me just comment. Sandy Peterson was kind enough to speak in my youth sport class for a couple of couple, two or three years in a row, and I always delighted in having her come in. And she talked a lot about something that I believe, Sandy, correct me if I'm wrong, that you labeled supervised spontaneity, which was an idea about how to address the concerns. I hear you as a parent, absolutely hear you. Sandy, would you be comfortable just mentioning what your thoughts were as a Parks and Recreation Director about that piece of providing safety? Well, what my idea was, was to simply, um, I worked for the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board I was a park director for 25 years, um, so I had plenty of hands-on experience, and then I became the youth sports director. But anyway, um, one of the, the things I was seeing was this safety issue, and um, that people didn't want to have their kids come out of the park and just be unsupervised. But I was also feeling that um, that, Sometimes there was a lot of things to learn from um, unstructured sport activity that you didn't get when the coach is organizing practice and telling you, okay, now we're going to do this and now we're going to do this. And then we go to the game and there's certain rules and um, maybe, maybe in hockey, um, I've been 
working on something, but I'm not going to work on it in the game because it might not work and we might lose because I wasn't very good at that yet or whatever. Um, so, um, and I firmly believe that there are so many things that kids learn from what I learned in grade school a few years ago. Um, <laughs> we played um, week-long um, workup games. I mean, we had three recesses, morning, hurry up and eat, long lunch, early afternoon. And we would start on Monday, and we would play until Friday when school was out for the week. And it was same places, and you just went and played. But kids learn um, how to help each other out. They learn how to make rules. If there's only six of us and we really need nine, we'll figure it out. If somebody's little brother or sister is along, we'll figure out how to get them in the game. Um, if, there's, if there's squabbles, we figure it out for ourselves. Anyway, so um, what my thought was, was that we needed to train um, our part-time staff who lead activities um, at the parks to um, help kids learn skills, help kids learn the rules, but the object is to work themselves out of a job so they just become more, more the supervisor in the background and it's the kids doing what happened in the early 1970s when I was working at Northeast Park or Van Cleef Park and kids just came down the park and said, Sandy, I need a bat and a ball and five or six of them would go out and play 500. Well, that wasn't happening so much anymore because parents weren't willing to just have the kids come down on their own. But if we had it as an activity but not so structured, then I just thought the kids would learn a piece that they weren't getting from being on a team and having a team schedule and those kind of things. Did that answer what you want me to talk yes, about? Thank, thank you, Sandy. And what made me think of it was it also covers the safety piece, that there is a supervisor there, but in the background. So thank you. I appreciate you letting me put you on the spot. I have two questions on the report. Um, one for Dr. Ainsworth and one for Dr. Duncan. Uh, one, with, related to the, the health chapter, what do you define as high and low physical fitness when you had the, the measurement scale and you know, some fell on the, the most on the, on the low side? How is that defined on your, on your physical fitness activity? You certainly gave us some best practices, 30, 45, and 60 minutes, but initially when you went in and measured some of the, the activity levels, how did you define high and low physical fitness? And then for Dr. Duncan, um, do you suspect the correlation between uh, the class offering that's geared towards boys and males and who specifically is, is administering those classes? And do you see that number changing um, as individuals who have been through Title IX are beginning to you know, kind of dive more into sport administration, recreation administration, and whatnot? Yeah, these... these um these levels for fitness were, were based on percentages that are identified from the fitness gram and uh, based on uh, quintiles for the, so the top 20%, the next to the highest 20%, on down to the lowest 20%. And they're all based on their age and sex um, abilities for uh, performance uh, across the, uh, the lifespan. Um, I don't think I got the full content of your question. You, you were talking about the correlation between the class offerings for boys, and what was the second part of that? You had mentioned a little bit about um, uh, how physical education classes are, are geared towards boys' preferences and male preferences. Right. Mm -hmm. Is that offering correlated to the specific type of individual administering those classes? 
Okay, so you're talking about the particular teachers yeah. and how they influence those um, offerings. Where does that number, do you see that, before casting that, that number has changed? Um, there's been some really interesting research done about how PE teachers, um, so, you know, sort of create their own rules for how to treat um, children in PE classes. It, what's interesting is that a lot of um, a, a lot of PE students who are training to go out into the schools um, receive some really good curriculum that um, that encourages them, you know, uh, to sort of shed some of these sort of traditional gender assumptions. Um, but what really seems to influence these teachers um, is the way, was the way they were uh, trained in their own PE classes when they were students. Um, and in fact, that has a much greater influence on how they teach than the curriculum itself. So what you have is this sort of perpetuation uh, of whatever um, ideas that the, the PE student who's in training to be a, a teacher, um, you know, uh, is, is accustomed to. And so it's not really a matter of, um, I, you know, it's not a matter of intention, I don't think. I think what happens is that the kids who are trained to become PE teachers just sort of revert to these assumptions about what is a good way to conduct a class. Um, and these assumptions, based on their experience, is what actually overrides the, the kind of curriculum that they've been offered, which, which tells them to be gender neutral. Um, so does that, is that the sort of thing you meant you were talking about? Yeah, no, your, your comments on, on it being a learned behavior and that's kind of yeah. the environment that they've grown up in, it's only learned. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, and I don't think, I, I also want to be very clear on this, I don't think that people, teachers uh, of any variety set out to, to say, well, I'm going to oppress girls in my class and... <laughs> I'm going to privilege boys. I, I think that um, the gender order is so built into our social institutions um, that people, you know, people don't really examine that. They just proceed on, uh, you know, the, the, the assumptions they, they grew up with, and they, they don't realize that they're doing these things. And um, PE teachers who talk about the problem with girls, I think, are very, very sincere. I mean, they want to get girls involved in physical education, but they don't see that what they're doing, um, unfortunately, really alienates girls from, from physical activity. And I'd also like to add that we also find that true in coach training um, in similar ways, and that, you know, coaches will reproduce what they have experienced as athletes as well. So it's not just limited to the physical education context. It gets reproduced in coaching as well. Um, sort of tagging on to this gentleman's question here, um, as part of your research, did any of you get involved in looking at the impact or what the NASPE new, new PE philosophy um, was about, where it was really trying to institute more physical education programs in the K-12 programs particularly that were um, engaging kids, particularly oriented towards girls, in lifelong fitness activities as opposed to it being the traditional competitive sports, which I think was more conventionally sort of gender focused. Did you guys deal with any of that at all or incorporate any of that into your research? Well, it, it did you want to go? No. Okay. Um, it's, it's, this is something that I think has begun to be um, embraced just recently. I mean, for a long time, the tech, 
typical curriculum was team sports, you know, get out there and play. Um, and team sports, of course, are great in, um, in, in grade school and high school because, you know, there are lots of kids there and you can make up teams e easily. But it, um, what's obvious, I, I think, is that once you get beyond a certain age, you aren't going to be playing team sports for very much longer. Um, and that what you really need um, training in is um, skills that will enable you to do the um, engage in sports throughout the life cycle. Um, so certainly, uh, I think there's a, a movement afoot to, um, to move in that direction. Um, I, I'm just not sure how successful it's been. Um, I di I'm, I'm the one who plopped the uh, NASP recommendations in Chapter 5, and I, I can't, I have to be honest and say I haven't read the entire manuscript or background to that material, but I'm a longtime AFERD member, our professional organization, as it, it sounds you know, in physical education, and I'm very aware of and um, always honor greatly practitioners and practitioners' knowledge, and what I like about how they generate those is involving both scholars and practitioners in, in coming together with curriculum guidelines. And so um, while I certainly value and want lifetime activities for girls too, I would also argue though that there is a place for team sports. I want it all. <laughs> I don't know if that's a you know, fair way to say it, but I want it all. There are many girls, me being one of them as a young girl who really love the team sports and things, and I don't want them to be disadvantaged, and I think the other thing that we talk about in chapter five that I would maybe add here is that, well, two things. One is that uh, certainly the, the physical activity guidelines were not just presented for uh, school-age students, but what I thought was nice was that we found some guidelines for infants and toddlers. You know, we spend most of our time thinking about school-age children, but I thought let's remind all of us that um, developing lifelong movement competencies and, and values and motives starts with in, in infancy with children, with, with what we can do as parents and, and people caring for infants and toddlers. And then in terms of curriculum, I was looking at guidelines from a variety of sources, including NASPI and AFERD, as well as ACSM and other recommendations as far as what a, a curriculum over the lifespan of uh, childhood to through youth years would look like, and it seems that in general a trend is recommended. In other words, elementary school is the time for broad-based, I think Margaret has said this also, physical activity experiences. Mm -hmm. Certainly many lifetime activities can start then too, but team sports, again, I, I would not be one to get rid of them, but a, you know, add other things in or, or exchange some things for others. But then as, as um, the general curricular recommendations that I would say we characterize in chapter five is that as girls get to into adolescent years that the emphasis does become more so on lifetime activities and on more fitness kinds of training and so forth. And so certainly there's a shift over the developmental spectrum in terms of what experts NASPI included, according to my reading, would recommend for best practices in curricular offerings. I don't know if anyone else wants to comment. I would like to make an, a note that there has been tension between uh, uh, those who advocate for fitness in fitness training in uh, traditional physical education settings versus uh, teaching of motor skills uh, during the traditional physical educating se sessions. And, and the rationale for the training of the motor skills or the teaching of that is that if you teach someone your fundamental motor skills, they're more apt to have the uh, capacity to perform lifetime uh, activities such as tennis or golf or those that we consider lifetime sports that that one can engage in over many of the years whereas if you just emphasize the fitness that that is doesn't teach those essential skills that can be carried on across the lifetime and I think that um, those the, the need for teaching the skills, the, the motor skills, and, and the training is essential. As young children, um, girls grow into adolescence. But there also needs to be um, a life time or a life skills um, uh, introduction of how you can use those motor skills and experiences to engage in physical activity that you may not have learned in school, but that you can um, engage in in the community, in the house, 
um, uh, with family, with friends, or with in other p places within the community uh, that we traditionally think of of lifetime sports and skills. So you, n you need both. You need it all. Well, I want to thank you all again, not only for a fabulous presentation tonight, but most of all for sharing your expertise and your hard work for producing an unbelievably groundbreaking Tucker Center Research Report. So let's have a big round of applause.